I'm going to go ahead and introduce Julia Bozeman. She is the president of the Foresight Institute, a leading nanotechnology, biotechnology, and artificial intelligence research group. She holds a master's degree in brain and behavioral sciences and is a GSP alumna of Singularity University. Uh, today, she will be talking about artificial intelligence and the future. Please join me in introducing Julia. We have built horses that can run faster than any naturally born horse. We've built birds that can fly further than any bird that has ever lived on the planet. And now we're building brains that are more powerful than any brain that has organically been born. And if we call this artificial intelligence, we would call this artificial flight. Because the intelligence is real, it's just built with a different material. Hi, I'm Julia Bossman. I'm the president of Foresight Institute. At Foresight, we spend a lot of time thinking about the future and thinking about technology and how we can make sure that our future is the best positive one. And you already see a teaser here that we have entered an age where talking about technology is not just something a few people in Silicon Valley do, but many people are becoming very interested in it, especially um, world leaders. So why are world leaders interested in hearing about artificial intelligence? This is what this talk is going to be about. Let me start with a few examples for you. So you might know this painter. His name is Edmund Munk. This is a painting, The Scream. And an artificial neural network has been trained on this particular artist's style to understand what this painting style is like. Now, here's a picture of a friend and I at Burning Man. And the neural network that had been trained on this particular art style was then given the picture of a friend of mine at Burning Man, and this is what it painted. So if Edward Munk had been to Burning Man, this is one of the things he might have painted. Now, another example from the arts, here's an artificial neural network that has been fed, is it on? Yeah. The entire works of Shakespeare, and then created a new kind of poem. And when you read it, you will notice it sounds kind of like Shakespeare, but you can't place it into any sonnet or into any drama, because it's not written by Shakespeare, it's none of his stories, it's just a machine that learned how to write like Shakespeare and then emulate the style. So now we're moving from the arts into games. You've probably all heard about the stories where chess was beaten by a computer, um, Jeopardy was beaten by a computer several years ago, and now the latest that happened is that the game Go was beaten by a machine. And this is a really big deal because it was considered to be so complex and con need so much human ingenuity, creativity, creative problem solving, and, and human intuition that machines would not be able to beat the, master, the human master at Go in 10 years from now. And earlier this year, exactly this thing happened where a machine called AlphaGo beat the best human in Go on the planet. And just think about this for a moment. 10 years from now, that would be 2026. So this was supposed to happen in 2026, and it happened this year. The way the machine does this is it had trained over and over and over again against itself until it found creative ways to solve a problem. With this one, actually, I'm going to move around a little so I can see what's going on. Does this work? OK. So here you can see how the, the same algorithm in an earlier version is playing the game of breakout. And this is after several trainings that it trained by itself. And it had figured out creatively that if it goes to the back of the wall, it can have the ball just jump back and forth and just clear the whole thing in no time. And this is something that many people need a long time to figure out if they ever figure it out. So in a way, it finds creative, whoop, there we go. In a way, it finds creative solutions to problems that we might not have even thought about. Yeah, I'll gotta show you one more time, there you go. 
All right, now I want to move on to some more practical matters. So retaining a law firm is something that is very expensive and usually only accessible to rich individuals or to corporations. But everyone could use some help with law every once in a while. So at least in the UK, there's a robot lawyer. You can find the robot on the internet. You can talk to it like a chatbot. And you describe your problem, and the robot lawyer will help you draft a letter to ask for your money back from a delayed flight or to contest a parking ticket. And um, by now, it has already saved people across the UK millions of pounds in parking tickets by doing this automated service. So services that were only for the elites are now becoming accessible to everyone by the use of artificial intelligence. Here's another example. If you write me an email and you want to make a meeting with me, I might CC um, an email address called andrew at x.ai. x.ai is one company that is building these services, but there are others out there too. And what this is, is a, a robot assistant. So this assistant will get back to you, ask you when is a good time, tell you about what my time is good, and then go back and forth with you until we find a meeting that works for us, and then it will send a meeting invitation to me and to you for the calendars. And I've done this with other people who have their own robot assistants, so then our robot assistants will talk to each other as if there was another human on the other end of the line, and they will figure out meeting times for us. And it's great, because we don't have to figure all, out all this complexity by ourselves. Again, this is a service that used to be only for rich people who could afford a personal assistant or for high-ranking corporate individuals. And now, with this service, pretty much everyone can use it right now. It's free to use. Um, you've since you live in the Bay Area, you've seen these cars around, most probably. Uh, this is one instance of the Google self-driving car. And the record of this car is impressive because so far it has not harmed a single human being in traffic, which we all know we cannot say of human-driven cars. Human drivers get tired, they get sleepy, they are distracted, they might even um, text while they're driving and then run into someone so once we have these cars, we can um, see drastic benefits in the lives we can save on the road. And this is a very complex task, by the way. So this was one of the hardest things for artificial intelligence to figure out because it needs to constantly monitor the environment. It needs to constantly make decisions what's going on. It needs to interpret what's going on in the environment. Now, the last example I want to leave you with is something that um, I find very hopeful for all of us. So this little boy is taking part in a sleep study just because I wanted to spare you the gruesome pictures of uh, small children with, with horrible diseases. But there's lots of horrible disease going on. And the level of complexity in publishing and medicine has exploded over the past years. So today, if a doctor wanted to stay up with the medical field with all the scientific papers that come out, he, would, he or she would need to read one paper every minute, every hour of every day. And the speed of the publication is still increasing. So next year, it might be two papers every minute, every hour, every day. And no human can do that. But a machine might. And a machine has even more benefits. They have uh, theoretically unlimited memory. They have um, way faster speed of reading. They can find... Um, insights and um, facts from all across and then draw connections and find patterns. So now that we may have reached the limit in medical research of the complexity that it might not be one human mind might not be enough to figure it all out, having a machine mind may open up the floodgates to figuring out much more in this, finding cures to diseases and progressing humanity much more through advancing science. And I mentioned before the explosive growth. So, so many of these things are happening on an exponential level. What this means is that only a few years ago, it was considered first impossible, and then was considered that it would take a very long time. But with exponential developments, you see that a, lo a long time, not much is happening, and then just 
the right circumstances come together so that it radically accelerates. And we might be just around the corner, so this, this graphic is the population explosion, and we might be just around the corner with the explosion of artificial intelligence too, where some services that we are building right now and frameworks that uh, Google, Facebook, and others are building um, feed back into each other and they all create things that are more than the sum of their parts, so it becomes more and more powerful and more and more valuable over time. So we're all good, right? All diseases will be solved, nobody will die in the street in their cars anymore, um, all services will be available to us at no or very low cost, and it's all great, right? So if you just felt a tiny sense of doom here, you're not alone. And we're not even talking about the far future here because we, um, when we think about controlling matter and controlling biology, we can have very, very high hopes. But um, we also want to talk about what are the things that could happen if we don't think about it. So one is uh, technological risk, where you probably know the story of the Sorcerer's Apprentice. Um, he enchants his broom to catch water, and the broom gets so good at it that he goes faster and faster and brings back more and more water, and the room fills with water. This is just one example of what could be a problem technologically. There are many others too, and luckily there are also many other very smart people that are working on these things. And if you talk to developers in artificial intelligence today, um, they are pretty much all aware of the things and they are doing, from what it seems like right now, the right things to make sure that these things are taken care of. But there are other things too, right? I showed you the politician uh, picture before. So what's going on with politics? Why are these guys concerned about that technical stuff? So let's go into that for a little bit. This is trucking. That's an industry that employs 10 million people in the United States alone. And these 10 million people might all not be needed anymore as soon as we have machines that can reliably drive trucks without falling asleep, without being distracted, without needing stops for food or for naps, and without needing all the salary and benefits that a regular human needs. And what is how would a human even compete with someone who can drive for thousands of hours at no end and does not ask for a salary? And this is just one example of the things that might get replaced with machines or very likely will get replaced with machines because machines are actually better for these jobs than humans. Um, you know, in many jobs, it's even terrible to be a human in that job and to, you know constantly be away from your loved ones, constantly have to focus on the road and so forth. So what society are we going to move towards? Um, I'm proposing that we're moving towards a post-work society. So up until now we have, work was a defining element in our lives. We would see our identities as what we do for a living. Um, we would consider other people or what do they do for a living. And it was a central question to our families and to our identities. Uh, where's the money coming from? What are we going to do for work? How do I develop my skills and so forth? And as I mentioned, developing your skills only makes sense if there's not um, an entity that is just going to be a thousand times better uh, than you. So are we moving to a societal dystopia? I would say this answer very much depends on what we all do in these today and in these coming years that are facing us. We are going through a defining time right now where we need to figure out um, how to move from the society we have today to the post-work society in a way that works for all of us. So this is how sustenance works. You all know this. You can either sell your time and you can have a multiplier on your skills. So if you are very skilled, you can get more money for the time you sell. Or you could own things and then you can just rent them out or you can slowly sell them over time and that's how you get money. Now, once the time goes away, the only thing that's left is ownership. And we all know that ownership is not distributed in a way that all of us could just live on that alone. In fact, most of us need to sell our time in order to live. 
And I want to posit this thought to you, that once we have figured out this dilemma and we have machines that will do most of the work on the planet and we have found a way that humanity can live comfortably with that, we will look back and think that it was barbaric that people had to sell most of their living time on this planet doing things they didn't want to do that they had to be away from who they wanted to be with, that they had to do things they didn't want to do for most of their conscious waking time on this planet. And there are other things. Uh, there have been societies that we can look at. So in Eastern Germany, when it was a communist state, there was zero unemployment. Everyone had a job. By definition, um, unemployment was always zero. And the result was you had the one guy in the street handing out leaflets, and then you had the next guy sweeping them all up. And then you had the next guy again sweeping the whole street again, which was already clean, just because everyone had a job, and it was not not possible to not have a job. Um, this obsession with jobs and work, and that everyone has to be full-time employed, is not something that has always been this way. So this gentleman, Edward Bellamy, more than 100 years ago, he wrote uh, his vision of what the year 2000 would be like. And he predicted many things accurately. So he, he predicted iTunes, he predicted Wikipedia, um, he predicted the internet and instant messaging, and he even predicted um, 3D printing in a way. So he was very good at predicting what kinds of technologies we would have by, the, by this time and age. The only thing he got really wrong was that he thought that all of us would only work uh, a maximum of four hours per week because everything would be so automated and we would have lives of more social engagement, of more time with our families, we could build and deepen our relationships um, because the workload would be so much lower. And I sometimes think that um, Tim Ferriss might be his reincarnation. And the idea that machines take work that humans used to do before is not new. So laundry, back in the day, used to take a whole day at the river. A bunch of people had to come together to get it done. And you started in the morning, and you were done in the evening. And when my grandmother and her mother got the first washing machine in the house, it was a, it was a front loader like this one, but of course it was a much, much, much uh, more previous model. It took three hours, actually, to complete the full cycle. And my grandmother and her mother sat in front of this machine and they watched the whole cycle go through. So one reason might be that attention spans were much better that day, back in the day. But the other thing might be that this machine had just changed their lives. All of a sudden, something that took a big part out of their week actually was now done by a machine. And they could spend this time on educating themselves, or they could spend this time on spending time with their families. They could even go out and maybe do other things or work. But they were no longer bound to doing these things. And the reason why we think this was a good development, whereas we think that you know, taking our jobs is a bad development, is only because this was not monetized. This was just something that people were expected to do, and the other stuff is monetized. So what this makes us realize is that it's not the fact that machines are going to do work for us. That would actually be a very good thing if we can figure out how to change the monetization and how to change the economy in a way that it works for us. So the way that it worked for my grandmother and her mother when they got a machine that did their job. All right, so part of Foresight's mission, we don't only work on accelerating the right technologies so that we can live in a prosperous and flourishing future, even though that is a big part of our work, we also think about what are the consequences of all the technologies that are being developed right now, um, and what are the risks and benefits? How do we make sure that we build a future that is awesome for all of us? Um, and this conversation is something that is not going to be solved by just geeks and programmers. Like, so many conversations that happen with technology um, happen in those circles. And that's also why I'm here to invite you to take part in these conversations. Think about 
um, what this means for you and what kinds of changes we need to move towards a positive vision. So the sustenance thing is one, and the other one is our own identities. Um, I mentioned before that many of us define us over our jobs, um, what we do for a living, how much money we make, uh, all of these things are important to so many of us. Are we willing to give up this kind of thinking for something better? And at last, I want to leave you with a story. So my um, grandpa, he was... I grew up in um, Germany, and my grandpa was 15 in the final year of World War II. And like all the underage boys in Germany during World War II, in the last year of the war, they all got drafted to volunteer for Hitler and to fight for the country, which, as you know, in the final days of the war, they went out as cannon fodder, basically, which we know in retrospect, the boys back then didn't know what was going to happen. So he went to the barracks, he went through the training for a few weeks with all his peers around him, and then on the final day, the general assembled everyone in the court, and he said, anyone who is not willing to fight for our country and who is not willing to fight for Hitler, now step forward. And my grandfather was the only person on that court who stepped forward. And he didn't know what was going to happen. He was 15 years old. Um, and in retrospect, we know that the, the war was almost over back then and he ended up being fine. But he didn't know at that point. The only thing that he knew was that he was acting on his own conscience. And this is something that makes me think what does it take for one person to have the exact same education as everyone else, be around their peers, go through the exact same experience of everyone else, be exposed to the same memes and propaganda and so forth, and still make a decision that is different from the decision that everyone else is making? And instead of looking outside, what are people doing? Look inside to their own conscious and make up their own mind. And whatever it is that did this, this is something that we need more of, especially in these years of change that we're facing. We need people to make up their minds about this, to speak up and say, yes, we want to have a good future, and we want to use technology to our advantage that it works for us, not against us, and we want to be involved in this conversation. Because we are facing decisions that we have never had to face before. And we can choose whether you know, it's going to be a crash or whether it's going to be a great future. So thank you very much.